Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, second chapter, beginning from verse 34 and 35. Then Simon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In Libya or not, we already enter into the uh, third Sunday in this new year 2020, and the fourth Sunday after Christmas. As the commercial culture quickly push away the Christmas jingles and spirit and joy behind this scene, so our hope and excitement of Christmas recedes quickly in the background of our lives. So here we are after four Sundays after Christmas. I would like to just invite you to recapture some part of Christmas spirit again, an important spiritual lesson that we need to hold on to and live on. As the cliche goes, out of sight, out of mind, because we are so easily forgetful. And if we don't see it right before our naked eyes. Uh, several Sundays ago, I mentioned about the danger of a commercialized Christmas. In my own opinion, a commercialized Christmas may be in wretched taste, but at best, it doesn't pretend to be anything else. What is really dangerous is a sentimentalized Christmas. Sentimentality being an emotion that does not arise out of the truth, but which is poured on top, diluting it and distorting it. Just roll back your memory a videotape and recapture the manger scene in Bethlehem. Bending low over the manger <coughs> where the Christ child laid, the ox and asses, they had tender touch. But they are not the guests because this is their home. The unsentimental truth of a Christmas is that, as the Bible records, that there was a no room for Christ in, this, in, the, uh, in the inn. Only because the innkeeper, knowing his guests very well, innkeeper knew that, like him, none would be inclined to yield his room. For Christ the child. The unsentimental truth of a Christmas is that he who to be the bread of life for whole entire human time is laid in the feed box of animals. Like those guests in the inn 2,000 years ago, people are often blinded by their preoccupation of getting what they want. They want more comfort, they want more money, more resources, more power, more popularism. But not the old man Simon, as we read it from today's passage. He saw the true joy of Christmas. He says, Mine eyes have beheld the salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all people. But he also foresaw how prohibited his salvation would be to those people who want their chief happiness. Please mind you that I'm not saying that God doesn't want to make, make us happy. I'm only saying that while God would like to make us happy, God would much rather save us rather than just entertaining us. 
Listen again to the Simon. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thought of many will be revealed. In a way that that makes a Christmas sound pretty terrifying, doesn't it? To reveal the, all the thoughts that we conveniently conceal in our heart. Before looking at this word more closely, let us look at for a moment about this old man himself. We read that Simon is just, upright, righteous, and devout. To use the old word in that particular verse uh, from uh, different translations, which certainly make him sound admirable, but not necessarily sympathetic. For highly principled people can be remarkably insensitive to frailty and suffering. But then we read, he looked forward to Israel's comforting. I think that sounds lovely. First of all, as an old man, Simon, he looked forward. And I think the Simon in the New Testament is the first example of the fact that the senior years in our life cycle are the formative years. Senior years is not the time that we just recede from the actions going on in life, but senior years, as Simone demonstrated, is still the formative years. Years when one sees the fundamentals of life so clearly, with fresh clarity and some sort of urgencies because we all know and I see this every day when I see my mom we all face the imminence of death someday and that awareness makes the preciseness of life and the meaning so clear but back to Simon looking forward he was old and fresh. I think you are only old and stale when dreams are replaced by regret. I think you are old and stale when you look forward only to be able to say, I told you so, but you didn't listen to me. Simon, however, has no need to prove himself. He is ready. He had lived this life and he is ready to accept anything that life brings. And even eager to go home, eternal home. He is aging toward the eternal light. Now think of his words. That thought of many may be revealed. I am impressed that the Bible locates the thought, our thought, not in our mind, but in our heart. It's as if there is a difference between what we think with our mind and what we truly feel in our heart. And I'm impressed by the strong suggestions of Simone's word that it, so to speak, the child, Christ's child, is to be born in the chambers of our heart and not first out into some anger. We are going to have to dislodge some of the thoughts presently residing there in discretion. You know, it's true that while in our mind we know everyone else is as important as we are. In our heart, we don't feel it that way sometimes, do we? In our mind, we know that all human beings are created equal, but our hearts don't always feel the monstrosity 
of inequality among people. Our mind tells us to rejoice in the fact that our congregation is multi-ethnic, but, but maybe some part of in our heart we still feel uneasiness about the changes, inconvenience, and whatever the challenge it brings. I think one of the important Christmas lessons that we may easily overlook is that we should not feel anxious if such prejudicial, uh, prejudicial thoughts are revealed or the thoughts that we never fully engage, but just keep it quiet, only if they are repressed. Some people assume that they cannot be both a this group of people or that group of people without projecting some kind of incomprehensive, not deep enough the understanding about group of people. How could it be otherwise even in our country? And let's not be just sentimental. Which is at one and at the same time that we have no doubt this great country, United States, there is none like it hardly in other part of the world. It gives people hope for those people who work hard to realize their dream, this country still allow that happen. And this country was built upon the deep Christian values. But also, we need to also realize that this great country was born in the blood of 10 million Native Americans. And this great country <clears throat> built upon and developed some backbone of its economy in the sweat of 40 million slaves. But if we reveal and do not suppress this prejudice deeply lodged in our heart. If we genuinely want to be free from these powers, God be praised that we have Jesus Christ among us and we have one another for all of us as a church. You know, we can refuse to become enemies that our prejudice wants to make us. We can grow deeply into the conviction that in Christ Jesus, we all are <coughs> truly one. And brothers and sisters, is it not the case that no salvation no consolation, no joy is comparable to that of people determined no longer to be enemies against one another, who are committed with love and forgiveness that overcome these dark areas in our soul and truly embrace one another as brothers and sisters. I don't think there is no other joy we can match up with joy of that reconciliation. If Christ is born anew in our heart through Christmas we celebrated four Sundays ago, I'm confident that by next Christmas in 2020, this church will have found many, perhaps some other way, to confront and to even confound some of our prejudices that we have, so that we can proudly claim on the PCIN brochures 
or in our PCI and websites that not only are we uh, intercultural and multi-ethnic, but more importantly, deeply interpersonal church in God, in God's love. However uneasy, uh, uneasy it makes us, we need to confront it if there is to be a room in our heart to embrace Christ who came as a Prince of Peace. Let Christ reign in our heart and in our life. So let us become more aware of the difference between how our mind thinks and how our heart truly feels. We think in our mind that this national security we are after and spend more than two billion dollars for it every day in our country. Maybe in our heart we worship military power and we worship the superiority. In our mind we may deliver that all nations are created equal with their own sovereignty of a nation, but perhaps maybe in our heart most Americans feel about the United States the way that Muhammad Ali talks about himself. I am the greatest. And the greatest not in terms of decency and integrity and love, but in terms of power. Let us heed to the words of Prophet Ezekiel. He said, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of splendor. Ezekiel chapter 28. A few Sundays ago, didn't we confess that Christ the child shall be called a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace? When you stop to think of it, all the armies that ever marched with the power, all the navies that ever sailed across the ocean, all the air forces that ever took to the air, in terms of influence, in terms of transformation, cannot hold the candle to this one little helpless baby born in the feed box of animal, and whose only sole possession at the time of his death was a piece of cloth that he covered his body. So let us now say we are powerless in the face of loveless power. Let us prepare ourselves so that with Simon that we may say that our eyes have seen not some cheap kind of grace and happiness, but thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the all people in the world. Let us cleanse the thought of our hearts with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that we may mean it when we sing together, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, come to our heart, Lord Jesus Christ, once again, once again, because there is a room now, as we are willing, to receive you as truly the Prince of Peace that reigns in our church, in our life, and let's hope in our country.